Hello. It's a great pleasure to be here. So, well, when we talk about the revolutions, I'm from Egypt, and I was part of the, part of the Egyptian revolution. <laughs> yeah, it's an endless hours of, of where's Waldo fun. Um, so I was, I was in Egypt during the revolution, and I'm currently based in, in Tunisia for work. And I often get questions about, well, how are things there? How are things in Egypt? How are things in Tunisia? Sometimes I'm asked to compare. And, and most of the questions are actually about the politics of it. Are, I'm being asked about, um, well, you know, the elections, the constitutions, etc. I'm never asked about the questions of every day. I'm never, nobody ever asked me, so, so what's the music scene in Tunisia now like? Or how are people feeling about their city now in Egypt? Is it, is it any different? And, and I thought that would, be, that would be fairly interesting to figure out, uh, well, what little revolutions have happened on, on people's everyday life, as opposed to the big overarching revolution? That, because the reality is, you know, the new draft of the Constitution or the negotiations over elections in some district aren't what impacts my life and yours on a daily basis. Right? It's, it's mostly the little, the little revolutions. So I started thinking about it, and then I started asking people, I asked the question on social media, and then I started asking, you know, and anybody would be willing to, uh, anybody would be willing to answer me. And I got this, like a massive jumble of, of ideas and, and of comments about what has changed in their lives. Now, some things, some things I could, I could expect, something we could guess, right? So we, you know, people said that, um, I love my city more. And there are things that I, I wouldn't have expected, like, now I spend more time with my neighbors. And so we started to, you know, we could spend a lot of time on, on probably each one of those. Um, but I started realizing that they were all some sort of, all of those are a manifestation of just a few small revolutions that had happened in, in, in our lives. And we'll try to, we'll try to, to take you through these a little bit. Um, you realize that they're all very connected to, to each other. Um, let's start with when people say, I'm, I don't feel, I'm not afraid anymore. I feel fearless. Now, you have to realize that dictatorships use fear to basically, dictatorships would want their citizens you know, to keep their head down and keep walking. They don't want them to start disagreeing. They don't want them to start objecting. And the way they do it is, is essentially by creating this environment, this environment of fear, and where they suggest that there will be repercussions. You know, if you protest, you'll get beaten up. If you write an article that is very critical of the government, your family could be harmed. There's this, there was this comic, it's, it's fairly cynical, it's not very funny, so you don't have to give sympathy laughs. Uh, but um, it, was, it was this little comic in the newspaper, and it's like a police spokesperson, and he's saying, uh, dear citizens, in order for you to communicate with the police easier now, you no longer have to dial 911. All you have to do is lift up the phone, dial any number, and we'll be listening. <laughs> okay? And, and like it's, 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 it's quite telling, really, of what kind of, what kind of mindset, mindset they wanted to, to get people in. And people really internalized this. Most people wouldn't really try to get into politics, try to, to argue that. A friend, a friend in Tunisia was telling me that you wouldn't even talk politics at home, just because so much you internalize that fear. And of course, there have always been, there have always been the, the, the few people, you know, the few, the few crazies, if you will, the few a small group of opposition who wouldn't want to follow that line and who would start, um, who would start objecting and opposing and sometimes trying to ring, ring the bells and try to wake people up. And sometimes that, that wake-up call is, is, is fairly violent and it's in the form of, of people dying. Um, but then, well, you know, one thing leads to another, one person follows another and then you have a critical mass and people collectively decide that, decide that, that, that they're not afraid anymore. And some, some fascinating things happen when people are not afraid. One of them is that, well, you know, if you're not afraid, fear, ch fear changes sides. And when it's not, on, not, it's not on people's side, it's on the government's side. The, 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 the picture on the left, yeah, that would be your left, um, is of the square in Bahrain called the Pearl Square, and it used to be where people would, would gather to protest, they would camp there, they would, that would be like the, you know, protest headquarters of, of Manama. And um, the government had no idea how to stop them. They tried. They would beat people up. They would shoot people on the way to the square, and, and it would fail. And at one point in time, and I, I have no idea what panicked mind in Bahrain came up with that, but they decided that the solution to make people stop protesting was to destroy the square. 
You know, I, I mean, I would have loved to sit on that meeting, you know, so you know, can, I can imagine that. Yeah, sir, we have people coming downtown to protest. You gotta say, destroy downtown. You know, it, it, <laughs> what kind of a panicked, freaked out mind would, you, would do that? If the government was afraid, not the protest, not the people who were unarmed and carrying flags and getting shot, it's the people with the guns who are afraid. We have similar reactions in Egypt that happens until now. Um, if, you, if, you, if you go to Cairo, the, the army and the police have been building walls in, in, in downtown Cairo, trying to somehow create some sort of distance between them and those protesters they fear so much. There's probably like a dozen massive walls and, and barricades and barbed wires that are basically blocking main streets in, 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 in Cairo. And uh, yeah, so, so fear, becomes, fear, fear becomes not on your side, it becomes on theirs. And when you start being afraid, you can start to imagine things. I, mean, I start realizing that the opposite of fear isn't, isn't bravery, the opposite of fear is imagination. Because you start to imagine that I'm not, you know, these are my streets. I will start walking those streets. These are my walls. I'll start painting those walls. You start to imagine a better future for your country and you decide to get involved. So you, you vote for elections. You run for election. You run for your city council. Um, NGO, you join civil society. NGOs are reporting really, really high numbers of people volunteering to do all sorts of things after, since, since the revolutions. The survey was done of entrepreneurs um, briefly after the revolution and if I'm not mistaken, 47% of them said that the conditions were more difficult to start a business after the revolution than it was before. And probably an equal number said that despite this, they were still going to go ahead and start a business because they believed that they could do it. When you're not afraid, you also imagine that you can express yourself freely. And protests are one way of, of expressing yourself. Speaking is another way of doing it. Another way of doing it is art. And you've had, you've had probably an explosion of independent art in, in I would say, in the post-Arab Spring country, actually in the current Arab Spring countries as well. Um, now, films are being created, films and, and, and theater, and theater are, is, is everywhere. Some are really, really good, some are really amateur, and, and that, that's not the point. The point is that people are expressing themselves. Some are political, some are not. But there's this climate of, you know, I, can, I have something interesting that I would like to share, and people are willing to, to take part in that. So both on the side of the artist and on the side of the audience, the mindset is different. And, and this explosion of art goes to, well, like I said, film, theater, um, music, and, and an interesting, if an interesting um, manifestation is rap, political rap music in Tunisia, which has always been this underground current of, of music, and now is, now is coming mainstream. People are rapping in Arabic and in French, about politics, and they used to be anonymous. Like the, 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 the picture at the top right, that used to be, uh, it's, it's a Tunisian rapper, he would sing anonymously in like, you know, was it underground CDs, and that was, that photo is still from him when he was on, on national television, which would have been impossible a year ago. I mean, he was, he was, he was openly making fun of, of Ben Ali and of, of his regime. And this is coming up. The photo at the bottom left, um, his name is his name is Bassin Youssef. He's the, uh, the he does a political satire show. I mean, think John Stewart in Arabic, huh? and he's he's brilliant. It started online. He started doing these YouTube videos, and now now he's on cable television. Another explosion of art, and that that will definitely hit you if you go to to, to a number of big cities. Uh, my hometown, Cairo, being one of them, is graffiti. There's graffiti everywhere. Like it started during the revolution. Artists starting to take control of the city, trying to take control of the walls. And it would start with political messages, then it would start with drawings, and some are really, really, really good. Um, and I remember I interviewed this artist probably the day Mubarak left, a few hours before he did, and he was telling me how he would like to see graffiti you know, be accepted as a form of art. And, and, and now it is, I mean, there are projects uh, in, in various places trying to you know, create, create, to basically keep a copy of all this, all this street art that has been, um, that has been produced. Um, some is, I mean, there's one of the main streets, if you, if you ever, if you're ever in Cairo, one of the streets that saw some of the hardest clashes has become some sort of this graffiti mausoleum for the people who died. They have those really beautiful, beautiful drawings of, of some of the people who, uh, who were killed. A lot of the graffiti is also anti, anti-army. Egypt is ruled by, by military dictatorship somehow. Um, a lot of it is, is anti, um, different political ideas. They're expressing themselves really, really loudly. Um, 
you know what I told you about how, how the army and has been panically building walls in Egypt, trying to block the streets? Well, guess what graffiti artists did to those? They painted them. And so this is, this is, this is a wall that, be, that blocks an entire street. And they decided to, you know what, fine. Well, well we, that is still a wall. That's legitimate ground for us. And it's also ours. This is our city. So they started this project that they called No Walls. And the idea was they were going to draw on those walls. And they're going to do things so, so beautiful that people might, just for, you know, for a split second, forget that there's a wall. This one, actually, if you want to see it, I don't know if you can see it, it's on the wall. Um, let's see. So you, have, you can see that the sidewalk, they drew the sidewalk to continue as if to give the rest of the perspective. So if you're standing on this side of the wall, it's as if you can see what's behind it. The end result looks like this. And these are street artists, and, and they're, 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 they're fascinating. And I think, I think it's really interesting that the name of their project, when they call it No Walls, it means that this is our city, these are our streets, and you know, we will decide if there are walls or not. Even if, it, well, whether it means that we're going to make them disappear by art, or whether, as they did about two years afterwards, people tore the walls down. Some of the walls in Cairo were torn by people with basically, with, with not, you know, some people went with hammers, some people went with anything they could find, and they destroyed one of the walls that, that this is in downtown Cairo. And, and that leads me to, to, to that point that I call ownership. People are relearning the relationship they have with their city, with their cities, really. Um, there are laws on the books of most dictatorships that have to do, that are a variation of, um, you are not allowed to congregate in more than five people in a public space because that will be considered a protest and we can put you in prison. Literally, that exists in, in, in Egypt, that exists in Tunisia, that exists in a bunch of other places. You're not allowed to gather with a group of people because somehow this is threatening. So people have always tried to keep distance between them and, and public spaces because they don't want to be seen as, 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 you know, if you're meeting with a bunch of people, you still don't want to be seen as protesting and get arrested for it. Now, it wasn't always, it wasn't always implemented, of course, but the fact that the law is there is, is really telling. And people are now learning to, well, Let's make our mark. This is our city. We need to reconnect with the public spaces. So people are spending more time out. People are, are, are... A great manifestation of this is something that took place a couple of weeks ago in, in Tunis, where people went to, um, to uh, Habib Bourqiba Avenue in Tunis, which was like revolution central, if you will, in where most of the protests were taking place in Tunis. And there have been protests, of course, since, 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 the, end of the, since the end of the revolution in January 2011 until now. And what they did a couple of weeks ago was they did something completely different. People took books and they went and they sat on the street. Now you have to imagine that it's a, it's a huge, it's a bustling street. They have cars whizzing on both sides. And people just took a book, a newspaper. They went alone, they went in groups. And they sat under a tree, they sat on the steps. And they just out for one afternoon. What that means is that these people were learning to own their streets again. It's a place that they were separated from by the force of the law and by the threat of, of the police. You're not allowed to be there. You, you can't hang out on the street. And people are learning to, to, to regain this ownership. I really think this, 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 this manifestation, I don't want to call it a protest because it wasn't, but it definitely sent a much stronger message than, than any protest, uh, than any protest that, that you could see. People said, this is our city, we own it. And the last little revolution that I would like to tell you about, which is probably, um, it's probably the most complex, is about women. And I, I titled this subsection, subsection Heroes because women in the Arab Spring have been fighting a double revolution. One is the revolution that we all know. It's a revolution against dictatorship. It's the one that we all took part in. But since there are, there's a different, different fight that, that is being, that's being somewhat imposed on, on women, on, on one hand, you have, you see the picture on the right, which, which you may recognize, it was, it was, it really went around the world. And there was a protester and she's getting viciously beaten up by, by an army, um, an army that really has no, the, an army that has no problem, has no qualms, viciously attacking women, sexually assaulting them at times to discourage them from protesting. And on the other hand, they are also fighting against 
a small but very vocal um, political religious ideology that believes that women should not be seen or heard and have no place in society. The, the picture on the left is actually a flyer from the elections, from the parliamentary elections we had a few months ago in Egypt. And um, by law, at least, every, at least every list needed to have at least one woman on it. So what this, what this political party did is that they didn't even want to put her photo on it. I mean, they put her the last name on the list, which is, which is expected from, from people like them. But they didn't even put her photo, they put a flower on it. I don't know if you can see it. This one, that, is, that, 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 that was supposed to be the, 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 the female member of the, uh, of the list. They didn't even put her photo. They don't believe that she has a place in society. And so women are, fight, are fighting these two extreme ideologies. And then they are battling to, to, to change the mindset, change how the population views the role of this 50% of the population. And I really think that we owe a lot to a small group of, of, of women, of, of fantastic people, of, of trailblazers, who are single-handedly changing how, how an entire nation views, um, views half of its population. I can think of a lot of people, but just, just to give you a couple of quick names. The first person on the left, her name is Samira Ibrahim. Uh, she was, she was um, arrested in a protest by the military, and she was subjected to what they call the virginity test, which is sexual assault by any definition. And instead of, instead of being afraid, as they were hoping, she decided to stand up, fight back, go public, and she was suing the army. Now, this, this, is, this is massive, and she is one of those people, you know, she's, 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 a pretty, she's a fairly shy person, and she comes from, she's, if I'm not mistaken, she's 21. And she comes from a fairly conservative family in the south of Egypt. And she decided to stand up and fight back. Uh, another person, which is the woman on the, on, in the middle, her name is Tawakul Karman. She's one of the, um, one of the leaders of the, of the Yemeni uprising, and she's also the woman who won the Nobel Peace Prize um, that she shared with, with, with two women from Liberia. Um, the third person, the one who's sitting, sitting in the street, that's um, Zainab al-Khawaja, who is a Bahraini activist. And she is a very, very famous, uh, she's a very famous activist. She is a force of nature. That photo was taken last week when she staged, a revo she staged a protest on her own. She sat in the middle of the highway to protest uh, that her father, um, who's also a famous, a famous activist, is, has, is, has been on a hunger strike and is dying in prison uh, with, with, on, on political charges. And so you have people like those. You have people I can think of, who else? Manal Sharif in, in, in Saudi Arabia, who is who's leading, uh, who's leading the call for a lot of women's rights um, starting with the right to drive. I can think of Buthayna Kamil, who's the first presidential candidate uh, in Egypt. And there are many, many such fabulous, f such fabulous people who are really making inroads in changing the way the Arab Spring societies are looking at, uh, are looking at women. These are true heroes, I believe. Um, now, so there are a lot of good things changing on our everyday lives, but please don't, don't think that it's all great and perfect. There are still a lot of, there are still a lot of problems. Um, Egypt's coming to presidential elections where basically the alternatives are both not very good. Yemen deposed their president and the next president that came was the vice president of the old one. Um, Bahrain is, Bahrain, people are still getting killed and people are dying in, in, of, of hunger. Uh, political prisoners are dying, dying of hunger in jails while, you know, while the royal family is enjoying the Formula One tour that was, uh, that was in Bahrain last week. So the big revolution is far from being over and the little revolutions in our lives aren't either. So stay tuned. Thank you so much.